Hi, this is an uh, introduction to game development, CS50. Uh, this is the Super Mario assignment, assignment 4. And this is the lock and key update. So let's run the program. Okay, nice sound there. Turn that down a little. So here's our guy. So here's the key. There's a matching lock box. You can see you can't do anything right now. Collect the key. Hit the box. Flagpole appears. Get the flagpole. New level starts. That's pretty much the gist of it. It's, it's that simple. Um, sometimes, oh, well, we got a bit lucky with that, but usually the. Uh, yeah, we get the keys a little further away. There we go. A new level. So you can see in the top left the score carries on. In the top right this is the width of the level. So you can see the width of the level increments by 50 every time. Um, so the level will be a lot longer. And with a longer level the key will be uh, randomly placed throughout the level. There it is. So it's a bit longer to get to. Here's the lock box. So watch the 200 increment. There you go. 250 now. So that's the gist of uh, how the game works. So let's take a look at how some of these features were added uh, in the Lua. So the first requirement is make sure the player doesn't spawn um, above a hole or a chasm, so above solid ground. In the level maker lure, I literally just added this piece here. So when we're generating the emptiness, we just want to make sure we're not generating emptiness at column 1 because our player always spawns at column 1. So we generate the level from left to right. Column 1 the player drops, we just want to make sure there's not a hole there, so don't generate a hole here when it hits the you know, the randomness. Um, very simple. Um, the next one in Level Maker generate a random colored key and lock block taken from keys and locks, uh, the PNG in the graphics folder. The key should unlock the block when the player collides with it, triggering the block to disappear. Now, triggering the block to disappear, um, I thought that was a little tricky given the code I'll explain why in a second so here we are here's the keys and locks um, they're 16 by 16 so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so there's 8 16 by 16 images in there and if we go back into the code here so in dependencies Lua I added a reference to the keys and locks PNG, which I just showed you. Here we're creating a G global frame um, property here, keys and locks, and it's just calling generate quads, which is in the util file, using textures here, which we've just defined here. And we're cutting out 16 by 16 chunks, so that will generate 8 16 by 16 chunks right here very simple um, it's how everything else is already done in the application in constants Lua uh, for lock and keys I'm just saying there's eight images in there we don't really need this we could kinda just hard code eight but you know that's dirty you don't want to hard code so I followed the kinda paradigm of you know what's in constants I just added my own from one to eight I'm doing lock and keys together. I could do 1 to 4 for locks, 1 to 4 for keys. It, it doesn't really matter. So where all this ties in, again, is level maker. Level ma uh, maker is hit pretty hard with these requirements. So generate one lock box in a random position. Now what I did, how I implemented this, uh, was these three lines here before we start generating the level. I say the lockbox position is anywhere on the level between the start of the level, which is 1, and the width of the level. So the lockbox can be in any position. Same with the key. The 
he can appear in any position and the key skin that's the color of the key because if we generate a red key we want to generate a red box as well uh, it, it's just graphically nice so I just keep a reference to the color of skin used now there's four keys and four locks so we want to generate a number between one and uh, one and four for the key when we generate the lock we just want to add four to this number here so we only need to keep a reference to the key skin so that's how we set everything up and define everything now if when we generate the chasms here I just want to make sure I don't generate a chasm below a locked box because that will be pretty annoying and I don't want to generate a key above a chasm either because that will be kind of stupid so I just added those in here so x is not equal to our kind of randoms here and you can put that where you want using this design so you can make sure you don't generate bushes where the key unlocks are you know you can kind of continue that on so here when I generate bushes I just don't want the key to overlap a bush just because I think graphically it will look a bit silly but it, it doesn't really matter it'll still work the key will you know appear in front of a bush um, if I carry on here here we go this is where we spawn the key so you can see here um, if x equals our key position which is the random variable we defined here so on this iteration we're um, displaying the key uh, we're inserting into our objects collection uh, using table insert just like everything else in this file a new game object we don't need a reference to it so it's anonymous in this sense the texture is keys and locks which is defined in dependencies um, keys and locks we want to generate the key at x minus 1 times the tile size so that is the current x position and the y is the block height now block height is used when we generate pillars because if we generate a pillar our block height will be 2 if we're not generating a pillar the block height will be 4 so that makes sure our key either sits on a pillar if there is one or on solid ground if there's no pillar so that's really what that means there uh, our keys and locks is 16 by 16 and our frame which is kind of the um, color of the key or lock is just passing in key skin which we defined here a random number between 1 and 4 um, it wants to be collidable so we want to pick up the key it's consumable which means if we collect the key the key will instantly disappear and features inside this function will sort of kick start so if Sam will play, I've increased the player score by 500 if they collect a key. I'm setting a flag here called key collected to true, which I defined up here. So by default it's false. So now it's true, so the level maker, well the level, um, knows we've collected the key. So that's useful when we actually try and hit the box. So just like we spawn a key now we want to spawn a lock box if x equals our lock box, uh, lock box position insert into our objects new anonymous game object keys and locks now the skin I've put plus four because if we generate the golden key at index one we know the lock box is underneath that four places higher than the key in the sprite sheet the lock box needs to be collidable because we want to you know be able to collide with it uh, initialize hit to false because we're gonna set it to true when we do hit it so it's not called again solid is true so it's, it's a solid item and I've added a new one here called locked box because the requirement says when you hit a locked box the locked box should disappear I don't like that because when the locked box disappears you need to spawn a flagpole now if you spawn a flagpole where the player is the player instantly consumes the flagpole and you go to the next level which is a bit dumb if I spawn the flagpole two places to the right or left of the player then we need to know if there's a pillar there or a chasm because we could be spawning a flagpole you know above a chasm or on a pillar but we need to know what is happening two places you know right of the player we can do that but it gets quite messy 
So I thought it'd be kind of cool if we spawn a flagpole from a lock locked box. So then we don't need to hide the locked box. It sort of grows out the top of it. I thought that'd be pretty cool. You could spawn a flagpole at the end of the level as well. I just thought it'd be a bit tedious getting a key, then a box, and going all the way to the end. It doesn't really matter. So if you do want to make the lock box disappear, I've added this here. Then in player lure, I've added this section here. So key cut, um, sorry, if our object locked box is true, so what we do when we collide with it, we set locked box to true right here. That happens when we're collecting the key. And in player lure, we're saying, okay, the, lock, the box is no longer locked and we've collected the key which is our global flag for collecting a key we can remove it from the table I tried using consumable but the way the code's written it's really confusing because if the object is solid and consumable those two things don't work together so in level maker this is a solid object because the player can kind of hit it, it's solid but it can't be consumable in the way it will disappear like a gem would for example so that's I could rewrite all that but I just thought I have this called lock box add that in player very easy I, it flows a lot better without changing a lot of stuff um, but like I said I'm not using that but if you want to use that that's how you do it um, then in on collision function for the lock box uh, this just says if we haven't already hit it um, then hit it um, well, where is it? There it is. So that's, this is used so this only gets called one time. That's the purpose of hit. If our key is collected, we know it is because when we collect the key, we set it to true here. Player sound. Make sure we don't call this again. Hide the lock box if you want to. Spawn a flag post. This was the last requirement, um, which is spawn a flag post and the flag itself. In here. Um, to make this better, I actually broke up the image which was provided. So here, the posts start about four pixels in. They're weirdly separated, and the flags, it, it, they're just all over the place. It was very hard to work with. So I just used Photoshop and put the posts in one file, all touching each other. Very easy, eight pixels wide, I think 48 tall, easy to work with and same with the flags all next to each other I didn't do a great job making them transparent it's details, it's a programming course not a graphic design course um, so you get the idea and with the flags and the flagpoles again in dependencies I added them as separate kind of textures so all the flag posts here, all the flags here same here I know my posts are 8 by 48 now and the flags are 16 by 10 very easy I didn't do any constants for those uh, because I'm just using the first flag and pole in that set. If I expand the game then yeah I will add flags and poles in here. But for, for the purpose of the requirement it wasn't necessary. So when we collide with our spawned flag pole, I'm actually defining this now so it's no longer an anonymous game object because we want to do something with it. I think oh no we only want to do something with the flag itself um, so flag post I'm um, using the flag post texture I want to spawn the post in the middle of the block it comes out of so I'm using the x-axis for the object which it's associated with which is the locked box so it's actually taking this value from the box and adding four to it because the flag poles eight pixels wide and we want to you know the pixel um the coordinate system starts at the bottom left corner and so adding four it makes it spawn in the middle the y-axis uh, we're using block height so you know the block could be on a pillar so we want to make sure the pole is coming out of a block that could be on a pillar so that's how we use the block height here minus four it's four tiles the width and height of the post uh, we're only using like i said the first texture in the file so we're using the yellow one for the flag and the post it's collidable and consumable because we can collect it and it's not solid so we're not going to bounce right off it um, 
This shouldn't be gem, this should be flag post. So the flag post, when you consume it, player sound, add a thousand to the player score, and then end the level. I'll explain how we end the level soon. Same with the flag, we use the flag texture. Um, I added plus six on the x-axis, which gives the effect of the flag being nicely wrapped around the pole, just as how the images were provided. The y-axis, again, a little different, just so it um, you know, raises on the pole. Uh, collidable, yes, consumable, same as above. And here we do the exact, exact same thing as above, because the player could collect the flag or the pole, but really, to them, it's one object. Now, I define the flag as a local variable here because we want to tween with it. Um, so what it does, um, it takes the current y-axis that it spawns at, and then tweens over two seconds to this destination on the y-axis here. So it goes from here to here over two seconds and plays a power up. And then we're just inserting these two things into our table of objects in the game. Very simple, really, I guess. Um, so the last thing to explain is the state machine, how we actually start a new level and things like that. So with the new level, uh, play state, right here. Huh? So I've added, sorry, I should say overloaded because it uses the state machine, the enter function here. I think we did that in match three. I've put all the code from init down here. Uh, so when we enter the state, let's go back to the level maker. I'm passing in the current player's score and the last width of the level the player was on. So the width we know because that's it this, um, in this for loop. That's how we generate the level. And we're passing in the player's score, which is provided to us in the onConsume function through the player object here because we, we can increment the score here. So they're the only two things I'm passing in. In the play state, we capture the score, which we're passing in. Stuff that in a variable called score. Same with the last player width. Stuff it in a variable called play, uh, level width. Now, when we first run the game, this is going to be zero, because our start state also calls play. You know, when we start the game, we press enter or return. So we're just passing in a default score of zero and a default last level width of zero. So this is where this is important. So if we go into the play state, we know we're starting the game, so we just give it a default value as 100. Again, I could pass 100 in, but then last level width, it might be a bit confusing. I thought that would, more, would be more readable if someone were to maintain your code or you come back to it at a later date. If it's a subsequent level, so we're not starting the game, we just append 50 to the last level. So the next level is always 50 tiles longer. So it starts with 100, 150, 200, etc. And I just rendered that in the top corner. Okay, um, that's pretty much everything I added other than the score we're passing in here. I'm just passing it in as a parameter into our player lure. So if we go to the player lure here, uh, da -da, there we go. I've added in into the init function here the score, and that just gets passed into the score. Um, this was already here; it was defaulted to zero because you always start a new game at zero. But when we want to start adding levels, we need to start passing our score around. So that's how that's sort of fed in, really. Um, so I believe that is everything I've added. Yes, uh, yeah, that's how you do multiple levels: the flag, post, and pole and locked keys sorry locked boxes and keys yeah cool yeah thanks for watching i uh, hope it helped and good luck with yours